worship, first graders and below. The rest of you can open your door. As you are turning there, many of you may be very familiar with the story of Yusef Nadarkini. Anybody know who Yusef Nadarkini is? He's the pastor in Iran who was arrested in 2009 on charges of apostasy. And just a few weeks ago, he was to be executed for his faith in Iran. He is a 32-year-old pastor with two children and a wife. And there's been a lot of intense pressure from the United States and many um, Christian organizations to, to stop his execution. And actually it happened. The, the, the Iranian Supreme Court decided not to execute him just a few weeks ago for being a Christian. And there's a transcript that comes from some of his court exchanges. And this is what he said. Repent means to return. What should I return to? To the blasphemy that I had before my faith in Christ? And the judge told him, you need to repent to the religion of your ancestors, to Islam. You need to go back to Islam. And he responded in the face of these persecutors, I cannot. I cannot recount my, recant my faith. So here's a man, a pastor, who faced extreme persecution of, to the point of being executed for his faith. And in the, in the eyes of those people looking at him saying, we're going to kill you, he said, I cannot deny the name of Jesus Christ. This type of persecution is happening all over the world. And if you don't think it's hit America, what happens if your name is Tim Tebow? Do you realize how much flack Tim Tebow has been getting for being a Christian? You'd think that the end of the world has happened because he's starting for the Broncos. I cannot believe the statements that are being made on ESPN and other places about Tim Tebow's faith. He's facing persecution. So here's the bottom line this morning. Here's where we're going. When the gospel advances in power, we should expect opposition. When the gospel advances in power, we should expect opposition. What have we seen so far in the book of Acts? We've seen the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. Peter gets up and preaches that powerful message and he, he calls the people to repent and trust in Jesus and 3,000 people are saved right there on the spot. And then we saw the life of the early church. They were praying, they were worshiping, they were evangelizing, they were teaching. All these things were happening and the Lord kept adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Last week, we saw Peter and John heal a lame man. A man lame from birth is healed and there's excitement and Peter preaches his second sermon and looks at them and says, repent that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come. So in the, in the book of Acts so far in these first three chapters, we've seen the gospel advancing in power. People are getting saved. Christ is being exalted. The cross is being elevated. People are being transformed. We see the life of this community of faith. Things are going great. Great. But how does Satan feel about this? Is he just going to lie down and play dead? Is Satan going to do anything about the advancement of the gospel? Do you realize that our enemy, the great red dragon, has been thrown down to the earth in great wrath because he knows that his time is short and he is on one mission to attack God's church. He hates the church, he hates God, he hates the gospel. So anytime the gospel advances in power, Satan is right there with opposition. And that's exactly what we see this morning. Right on the heels of what we saw last week with this great miraculous healing, this great sermon from Peter, this great call to repentance, opposition comes. So let's read together Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22, and let's see how when the gospel advances in power, Opposition comes. Chapter 4, verse 1. And, just a side note there, you don't normally start sentences with and. This is a connection to chapter 3. It's the, it's the continuation of the story. And, the story continues where we left off last week with the healing. And, as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed 
because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Two big sections this morning of this passage of Scripture with the overarching theme, when the gospel advances in power, you should expect opposition. So here's the first issue. We see this in verses 1 through 12. Here's what it is. Proclaiming the exclusivity of Christ will annoy people. Now what do I mean by the exclusivity of Christ? What I mean by that is saying that Jesus is the only way of salvation. When you begin to say that Jesus is exclusive, he's the only way of salvation, people get annoyed. It happened back then, it happens today. Now here's what's going on. Right after they heal this lame man, Peter gets up and preaches this message. Remember, he's preaching in the name of Jesus, he's preaching repentance, and then the religious Gestapo doesn't like what's going on. You've got the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees. Three groups of people come against Peter and John. Who were the priests? These were the seminarians. These were the rabbis. These were the, the religious leaders that, that had all their theological ducks in a row. Who was the captain of the temple guard? He was the chief policeman. Who were the Sadducees? They were the liberals of the day. They were the liberals. They were this rich group of religious leaders who didn't want to rock the boat with Rome. They didn't want to cause any troubles. And so they just kind of said, well, let's just kind of try to all get along. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection. But yet they were the religious leaders in power. And all three of these groups come against the apostles for one thing. What do they do? Verse 2, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Seems simple enough, right? They're just preaching Jesus. They're explaining Jesus. They're, they're exalting Jesus. Doesn't seem like a big of a deal. But let me just tell you something. In the book of Acts, and even today, there are two responses that happen when you clearly and accurately preach Jesus. The first response is what we've seen in Acts so far. People get saved. Lives are changed. Communities are transformed. People get the gospel, and they are radically changed. It's an amazing transformation that happens. We see the number keep uh, multiplying here in the early part of Acts. That's the Response number one to the gospel, people get saved. But here's response number two, people get mad. They get annoyed. Do you realize what happened to Paul? Paul would walk into a town. We'll find this out later as we go through, as we go through the book of Acts. Two things happened to Paul when he walked into a town, either revival or riots. Either people got saved or people wanted to throw him out. Revival or riots. 
And these religious leaders were greatly annoyed. Greatly annoyed. That word means they were worn out. They were exhausted. They could not put up with Peter and John anymore. They were at the point of exhaustion saying, we don't like these guys. Why? Why were they worn out? Why were they annoyed? Well, because they were teaching. They, these uneducated normal guys, were actually assembling a group of people, 3,000 of them, and teaching them about Jesus. And so the, the, the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're a little upset because we're the teachers. We're the ones in charge. They're taking people away from us, and they're talking about Jesus. And so they put them on trial. They put them on trial. Notice what it says. Verse 3, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to 5,000. So when the gospel goes forth in power, more people are getting saved. It's 5,000 now. 5,000. It goes from 3,000 to 5,000 more. And then verse 5, on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gather together in Jerusalem and bring these men on trial. Now think about the thoughts that are going through Peter and John's minds at this point. It wasn't just that long ago that Jesus was on trial with these same men. And it did not go well for Jesus, if you remember. It was a kangaroo court with false witnesses, with manipulation, with trumped up charges. And so Peter and John were probably thinking, okay, Jesus was in front of these men not just 50 or so days ago, and he got crucified. Are we going to be next? Are we on the chopping block next? Are we going to be crucified next? Will we face a Roman cross next? And so these men would get in like a half circle and they'd be up on these benches, kind of like the Supreme Court looking down upon Peter and John, peering into them. And they couldn't deny the miracle, could they? They, they couldn't deny that the guy was, was, was healed. That wasn't the issue. The healing wasn't the issue. The issue was the theology behind the healing. So they knew they couldn't get him on the healing. So they asked the question, by what power did you do this? Whose power are you doing this in? Verse 7. By what power or by what name did you do this? Okay, is it, is it Satan that you're doing this by? Is it God? Is it some Greek God? The bottom line is they wanted to arrest Peter and John on the charges of blasphemy the same way they wanted to arrest Jesus. But here's a question for you. If you ask Peter a question, are you expecting to get an answer? Don't ask Peter a question unless you want an answer. He's Peter, right? He's going to give it to you. And here's what we've got. Peter's not going to be silent. We've got Peter's third sermon in the book of Acts. In four chapters, we've got three sermons. Peter just can't stop preaching. And he begins to give his third sermon here, his third message, this, this third preaching moment. And so what I want us to do is consider four aspects of Peter's message. Four things that surround the message of Peter that he gives to these onlooking persecutors who are trying to arrest them. Here's the first thing that we notice. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you may be asking a question at this point. I thought Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit back at Pentecost. And you would be correct. Why is he filled again? Is there a second filling of the Holy Spirit? What's going on here? Let me explain to you something theologically just for a moment before we go any further. When you become a Christian, when God causes you to be born again, you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you. You've got the Holy Spirit. Every believer here today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit Theologically, that's the truth. But the Bible speaks of a filling of the Holy Spirit that comes upon believers after they are saved. This filling is almost always involving boldness of speech. It's a, it's a point in time where the Holy Spirit comes upon a Christian to empower that person, to empower that Christian to boldly speak the gospel. Whether it's standing up on a pulpit talking to a congregation, whether you're next door talking across the fence to your neighbor, it's a point in time where the Holy Spirit fills you with power to be able to clearly proclaim the gospel message. And Peter was probably reminded of the words of Jesus. At this point, what did Jesus say back in Luke chapter 12, 11 through 12? Jesus said, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about, what, uh, about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. 
That's what's going on right here. Peter's being filled with the Holy Spirit to defend, to proclaim the gospel. We must always remember the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's our helper. He comes to fill us with power to say what we need to say at just the right time. Have you ever had that experience where you didn't know quite what to say, but then the words came out and afterwards you're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Did I really say that? And you're like, that didn't really come from me. No, it didn't come from you. It came from the Holy Spirit. In that moment, he empowered you. He filled you to boldly proclaim the gospel. That doesn't mean that we should never learn stuff. It doesn't mean that we should just sit around and wait for the Holy Spirit to tell us stuff. Yes, we've got to study. We've got to know our Bible. But it's that supernatural experience where the Holy Spirit fills us with power to be able to present the gospel. Second thing. We've seen this over and over again, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But what does Peter focus on? The second part of Peter's sermon, hopefully by now you know. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. Right there in verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Peter's always talking about the cross. He's always talking about the resurrection. He's always bringing that whole theme back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And again and again, we, we, we've talked about this the past few weeks. The gospel is not the gospel without the cross and the resurrection, the things we've been singing about this morning. We spend enough time on that, we don't need to spend any more. What's the third thing that we see about Peter's sermon? He accuses them of rejecting the true cornerstone. Now what in the world do I mean by that? Notice what he says. Verse 11, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. You personally, you're the builders, you've rejected this Cornerstone. Now, what in the world does it mean that Jesus is the cornerstone? Well, in Psalm 118.22, we have this prophecy. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Okay, Old Testament talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, being rejected. What did Jesus say about himself? Luke 20, 17-18. He looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus says, you guys are rejecting me. I'm the cornerstone. The cornerstone of what? We'll get to that in just a moment. 1 Peter 2, 6-8, the same Peter that preached right here, he wrote a epistle, he wrote a, he wrote a letter. 1 Peter 2, 6-8, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. Now, the word here for cornerstone, it's a compound Greek word that basically means the top stone, the head corner. There were two words for cornerstone. One was the foundation stone that you would lay first, the foundation of the building, but one was that last stone that you'd put that would connect the arches together. That's really the word that is used here. But if you think both of these Im- imageries, these metaphors together, when you think about building terminology, Jesus is the foundation, Jesus is the head. He's the top, he's the top, he's the bottom. He's the Alpha. i got to get my directions right. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. What Peter's saying is Jesus is is the head of everything. He's the ultimate authority, and you have rejected him. But fourthly, and I think this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, this is where it really gets, they get really get annoyed. This is what really annoys people. This is why they were annoyed. Peter clearly, emphatically states in verse 12, that Jesus is the absolute only way of salvation. Notice what he says in verse 12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, I'm going to stop, and I'm, I may be yelling at you here for just a minute, okay? You ready? So just, just calm down. It's all right. I'm very, 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 very concerned about the way our culture is going when it comes to this issue of Jesus being the only way of salvation. And there are three key passages in your Bible that you need to know. This is one of them. Acts 4.12, underline it, highlight it, know this passage. I want to give you two other passages because this doctrine is going to be under attack whether we like it or not. Acts 4.12, Jesus is the only way of salvation. The other passage passage is John 14.6. John 14.6 says this, 
Jesus said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Highlight it, underline it. Get familiar with that passage of scripture. Know where it is in your Bible. Acts 4.12, John 14.6. There's one other passage that you need to know. That's 1 John 5.12. 1 John 5.12 says this. Whoever has the Son has life. Or whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So in other words, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. Now I'm going to address some issues here this morning because there are six predominant views that are circulating around in our evangelical world right now that are trying to fool you as Christians into thinking things that are not biblical. But I want to address these these six views because they are creeping into the church, not just creeping in, they are coming in like a whirlwind. So let me tell you what these six views are in relationship to this whole idea of Jesus being the only way. Here's the first one. It's called universalism. Universalism. It's the most liberal, it's the most extreme view. It's basically the view that says everybody's going to heaven. There is no hell. Maybe it's for bad people like Hitler, but for the most part, everybody's going to heaven. Do you hear that? Everybody's going to heaven. We're all going there. That's universalism. Number two is called inclusivism. Inclusivism. I'm sorry, pluralism. I'm getting ahead of myself. Number two is pluralism. Pluralism. Here's what pluralism says. Pluralism says that you have all these world religions, Buddhism, Islam, New Age, um, Hinduism, and basically all of these religions have enough, have enough truth in them to get you to heaven. So you just need to be sincere in whatever religion you choose. So if you're a Buddhist, be a sincere Buddhist because that's going to lead you to the path. If you're a Hindu, be a sincere Hindu. Just be sincere in your belief system and, if, and all belief systems basically will end up at the same place. All roads lead to the top of the mountain. Here's two problems with that. Number one, if you look at all the world religions, they're not the same. You're just basically, um, you're basically um, being disrespectful to a Muslim if you say Mu- Islam is the same as Christianity. They're not. And number two, how do you define sincere? Who defines how sincere you are in your belief? So pluralism says that all religions basically teach the same thing and they're all going to the same place. Okay, number three, inclusivism. This is the, the the inclusivism is the idea that you got the, the native in the deep dark jungles of Africa and he looks up at the moon and he sees, okay, there's a moon, there must be a God up there. I know in my conscience there's something wrong. And so if he's sincere in worshiping the moon and that's all he does, Based upon that, he's going to heaven. Whether he's ever heard about Jesus, whether he's ever trusted Jesus, based upon general revelation, he's going to heaven. That's very popular. This whole idea that, that you just, you know, just go by what you have in general revelation. If, if, if you notice the sun's up there and you begin worshiping the sun, that's okay. It'll get you to heaven. Here's another one maybe you've heard of. Number four, after death evangelism. Those who've never heard will get a chance to hear after they die. Kind of like Roman Catholic purgatory. Once you die, there's going to be a chance after death to somehow get it right. Problem with that. Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 says this. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, takes kind of reincarnation out of the picture, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. There is no chance after death. Here's the fifth one. Maybe you've heard of this one. It's called universal opportunity before death. This is kind of a weird one. It's this whole idea that every single person has the opportunity to hear about Jesus and God will give that opportunity to them right before they die. So right up to their dying day, it may come in a vision, it may come in a dream, it may come from an angel, it may come from an earthquake, but God's going to give everybody an opportunity right before they die to hear the gospel so they can trust Jesus. The problem is we don't see anything in the Bible supporting that. So we're left with number six. And I hope, and I beg, and I plead with you that this is the one that you believe. This is the one I believe. It's the one the Bible teaches. It's the one our church believes. Here it is. Exclusivism. And it's basically this. Any person on planet Earth who dies without personally placing faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will spend eternity in hell. It's not popular. 
What I'm saying is not popular. What I'm saying could get me thrown off a television talk show or made to be laughed at or or fruit and vegetables thrown at me. Let me digress here for a moment and talk about a book you guys know I love, near and dear, right? The Shack, not. On page 110, listen to the words of Jesus from The Shack. I am the best way any human can relate to Papa, the Father, and Sarayu, the Holy Spirit. Now, think about the subtle change there. Jesus is saying, I'm the best way. Did Jesus ever say he's the best way? No, he said, I'm the only way. And you've got preachers and teachers going on talk shows saying, well, Jesus didn't really say he's the only way. He's just saying he's the best way. Out of all the alternatives out there, Jesus is the best way. Let me just repeat, in case we're not clear. You are not saved by Allah. You're not saved by Buddha. You're not saved by Hindu. You're not saved by Oprah. You're not saved by Joseph Smith. Anybody else I think I can offend this morning? You're not saved by those people. You are saved by Jesus Christ alone. Let us stand strong on that. Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. This stance is going to annoy people. Can you see why now it's tempting to to change your message? If people don't like your message, if people want to throw things at you, if people are going to call you an intolerant, bigot, unenlightened, um, whatever other word you can think of, what else did I write down here? Make sure I read it because I want to say it. Who wants to be thought of as an idiotic, narrow-minded, unenlightened, intolerant bigot? None of us do, right? But that's what the world is telling us when we say Jesus is the only way. So do you see the temptation there is to try to change the message so that it's more palatable, so people will accept it? Now here's the shift. The first issue we looked at this morning is proclaiming Jesus is the only way will annoy people. Count on it. Here's issue number two. Regardless of the consequences, we've got to keep on preaching Jesus is the only way, even if it annoys people. People will either reject you or they will be saved. There will either be revival or there will be riots. They will laugh at you. They will mock you. They will call you bad names. They will say all these things about you, but we cannot back down. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That word folly in the original language is where we get our word moronic. It is moronic, it is ludicrous, it is totally um, crazy to people to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation in this whole cross business. Notice what else Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 through 16. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. And among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to death, to other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Do you understand what Paul's saying? To those that don't like our message, we're going to smell really bad. It's going to be offensive. It's going to be rotten. It's going to be an aroma of death. They're going to hate us. They're not going to like us. We're going to stink in their nostrils when we come along. But to another group, those who are being saved, those whom God is calling to himself, the message is going to be beautiful, it's going to be wonderful, it's going to smell great because they know that they need salvation. And that's why Paul says, who's sufficient for these things? That's a big burden to carry, to know that if I'm going to go to someone and tell them Jesus is the only way and they're going to hate me and I'm going to be the smell of death, who's sufficient for these things? Who's sufficient? I want us to look at four other issues briefly here related to the second issue of regardless of the consequences, we've got to keep on doing it. Even if it annoys people, we've got to keep on doing it. Let's look at four issues. Just like there were four issues related to Peter's message, let's look at four other issues. Look at verse 13. Here, here's the first issue. It will require Holy Spirit-empowered boldness. I don't know of any other way we can do it without Holy Spirit-empowered boldness. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, key word in the book of Acts, boldness. Shows up over and over again. Parasia, the Greek word. It means to have a freedom of speech, to have this confidence, to be able to speak clearly. And it almost always happens after someone's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a quote from our friend Artaxerdia in his book, Spirit Empowered Preaching. 
He says, when the Holy Spirit powerfully attends the preaching of the word of God, there is an ease of speaking, a holy authority, an otherworldly kind of courage that can compel an ordinary man to invade the domain of darkness and demand the deliverance of people enslaved to that realm. I like what Art says there. It's an otherworldly kind of confidence. We are going to need the Spirit-empowered boldness to keep on doing this. Let's just be honest. It's kind of scary in our world out there to go out there and just lay ourselves on the line and say, yeah, we're a Christian. We really believe Jesus is the only way. Well, you're intolerant. Well, maybe. You're a bigot. You're unenlightened. You don't have compassion. Now, we know those things aren't true, but those are the words that are given to us. And I don't know how you're going to survive unless you have Holy Spirit-empowered boldness to keep doing it. It's got to come from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the second issue. This is where I love it for you guys. It's not a matter of I can, you're like, wait, what I'm about to say may, may offend you actually, but let me say this. It's not a matter of IQ, education, or prominent position to speak about Jesus. What does he say? What do they say? Verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated common men and they were astonished. Now, uneducated common didn't mean they were ignorant didn't mean that they were stupid. It didn't mean they lacked intelligence. What it basically meant was they hadn't gone to seminary. They hadn't gone to rabbi school. They hadn't gone to the academy to learn about Jesus. All they were were these, these non cemetery trained, non-professional guys who had seen something. They'd been with Jesus for three years. They saw him on the cross. They saw the tomb empty. They saw him raised again. He appeared to them and said, go preach this message to people. And they said, okay, we'll do it. They didn't have training here's where it gets exciting for you. You don't have to go to Bible college or seminary to be an evangelist for Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to go to Bible college. Let me just give you a newsflash. Most of you in this room know more than you think. You just got to say it. You just got to share it. God will use you mightily. God can use the most seemingly insignificant person in this room who doesn't think they have the greatest talent, the greatest ability, the greatest IQ, the greatest accolades. If you are faithful to this word and you are prayed up like crazy and you testify to who Jesus Christ is in the power of the Holy Spirit, God can do amazing things. It doesn't mean that you won't get stumped. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to answer questions or objections. It just means that, you know what a lot of pastors say? Leave this for a professional. Please do not try this at home. You ever watch Mythbusters? Don't try this at home. This is only for the professionals. I'm going to say the exact opposite. This is not for professionals. It's for you. Try this at home. You can do it. You can share it. You can have an impact. These were ordinary, average guys who had just been changed by the power of God, and they told what they, what they saw. Here's the third issue. Proclaiming Christ really comes from the extent to the time in which we've spent with our Savior. I want you to catch something really, really briefly here. At the end of verse 13, they recognized they had what? They'd been with Jesus. And let me just say this. If you want a carefree, stress-free, easy-going life, don't be with Jesus. What did Jesus experience in his life? Persecution, suffering. And if we want to identify with Christ, then we need to experience the same things he did, be with Jesus. When Jesus spoke his mouth, when Jesus spoke and when Jesus preached, there was opposition. When you take the name Christian, you better expect, you better expect opposition. But think about it this way. Their speaking about Jesus came from the overflow of them being with Jesus. Can, can that be said about us? Somebody would say, my goodness, You've been with Jesus. You talk a lot about Jesus. You seem to know this Jesus. This Jesus just seems to exude from you. You're saturated with this Jesus. You're in love with this Jesus. You really are, a, are enamored by this Jesus. You've been with Jesus. That's the way people should look at us and say, my goodness, there's something different about you when you speak, when you share, when you talk. It seems like you have been with Jesus. A few weeks ago, Kathleen and I'm not going to use names because it's being recorded, but when she came and she visited with us and told us about her experience in, in a Muslim country in northern India, and she talked about all the things that were going on, we took her out to lunch afterwards, and she said something that resonated with me that was very, very interesting. She said, in that culture, they're very spiritual. They talk about spiritual things right off the bat. And if you hide the fact that you're a Christian, 
And like you wait three months down the road to tell them that you're a Christian, they will not respect you. They'll write you off because they want to know right up front what's important to you. And if Jesus isn't that important to you that you wait three months to talk about him, then maybe he's not that important. They will not respect you. It needs to be evident. Now, I'm all for friendship evangelism, but when you wait two years to share with somebody about Christ, you've kind of gone a little bit too far. We need to be upfront about who it is that we believe. And here's the fourth issue. Continuing to speak with boldness, even in the midst of annoyance, we need to continue to do it. We just need to continue to do it. Continue to do it. Continue to do it. We're gonna get, people are going to get annoyed. People are going to get mad. We can't back down. We've got to keep doing it. Now, here's what happens in verse 17 and 18. These religious leaders basically order them not to speak any longer in the name. They charged them. They said, okay, we can't deny that the guy got, got, got healed. We can't deny that. But here's what we can do. We can try to stop the spread of this Jesus business. So they go to Peter and John and say, we charge you. We command you. Do not continue to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Don't teach in his name. Don't preach in his name. Don't do it. We're ordering you not to do it. And I love the response of Peter and John. Look at what they say in verse 19. Peter and John answer them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen or heard. They're basically saying we can't help it. We cannot help but speak. You can't stop us. Throw us in jail. We'll keep preaching. All we know, Sanhedrin, Pharisees, Sadducees, is that one day our Savior, who we followed for three years, was nailed on a Roman cross. He cried out at his finish. They put him in the grave. He rose again. He appeared to us, and he commanded us to go preach and teach this. And out of obedience to him, we are going to do it, whatever comes. We cannot back down. Anything less would be disobedient to our Savior and Lord. We're going to keep speaking. And when opposition comes, and those threats are being breathed down our necks. And those charges of being intolerant bigots are coming at us like a wave. Do we have this same attitude? I don't care what you say. I gotta, I gotta keep saying it. Whatever comes, I'm going to preach it. And I've told my wife this. Don, be prepared for me to be in jail one day. I honestly believe there may be a day where this pastor of yours may be thrown into jail because of the things I rant and rave from this pulpit. Do you agree with me? Maybe that's too extreme. But I can't think of any other time in recent history than we need to be strong on this issue of Jesus is the only way. I can't tell you how many... How many pastors, famous pastors, come along? It seems like week after week, and they just start capitulating on these issues. We've had the most recent one, Rob Bell, in his book, Love Wins. Love Wins, his book, basically, he's this popular pastor out of Michigan who's had a great influence on the younger generations, basically saying, there's no such thing as a hell, and I'm not really sure if Jesus is the only way. And supposedly, he's an evangelical that's having influence on a lot of people. The gospel's getting diluted in our culture. We no longer talk about the wrath of God. We no longer talk about repentance. We no longer talk about sin. We no longer talk about holiness. We no longer talk about the demands of the gospel. What we say to people is this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. If you just ask Jesus into your heart, try him out as frosting on the top of the cake. And if you really want to have a good life, just, just kind of try Jesus out. He'll give you a better ride. That is not the gospel. That's half the gospel. Yes, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but the full gospel is you are a sinner under God's wrath and you must repent and believe in Jesus in order to be saved. And you don't, take, you don't try Jesus. Like, I'm going to try Jesus like a pair of jeans. No, Jesus is Savior and Lord. We don't try him. You submit to his lordship. You confess him as Savior and Lord. He has absolute rights over your life as the God and King of the universe. You don't try Jesus on. As if, like, you get tired of him, you're going to throw him away. You submit to him as Savior and Lord. And as pastor, I want to see the advancement of the gospel. I want to see what we see in Acts. I want to see transformed communities. I want to see lives changed. I want to see marriages restored. I want to see relationships healed. I want to see boys and girls and men and women get saved and baptized. I want to see the Hispanic mission that we have on Thursday nights, see God reach the Hispanics. I want to see our, our people group in India be reached. I want to see God do an amazing thing, but I understand this. The reality comes that when we see the advancement of the gospel go forth in power, there will be opposition we cannot back down 
Let's not retreat. Many churches are retreating. Many Christians are retreating. Please do not retreat. Be salt and light. Let us never waver on the truth that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Let us never waver on the truth that there is eternal hell of conscious torment forever for those that have never trusted Christ. Let us never waver on the need for repentance. Let us never waver on the old rugged cross. Let us never waver on the empty tomb. Let us never waver. We may get laughed at. We may get maligned. We may get mocked. We may get spat at. We may get uh, slandered. We may even get persecuted. We may even get thrown into jail. But let us hold fast our confession to the very end. What does the writer of Hebrews say? Hebrews 10, 23, he says this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Faithful to do what? God is faithful to sustain us to the end. I, I'm bothered by this. You probably hear it in my spirit this morning. I am very concerned about this. I, can't, I bet you in the next year or two, Famous evangelical pastors that you may have listened to on the radio or people that you would hold up in high esteem will slowly and slowly begin to backtrack on this issue out of pressure. What's the pressure? We gotta grow our church. And if we gotta grow our church and I see things are offensive, people won't come to my church. And then I won't have a job. And then I won't look good in my denomination. And then I'll be sad. Let me say this. If there are five of you here and I'm preaching this, praise the Lord. If there are 500 of you and I'm preaching this, praise the Lord. I will not stop preaching this regardless to try to pander to this audience. I hope you know that. I want this church, whether I'm dead, whether I'm hit by a bus, or whether God calls me on someday, I want this church to have a legacy to say, regardless of what the culture says, we are going to hold fast to the confession that Jesus Christ is the only way. That's it. Bottom line. No wavering. No equivocation. No backing down. And let me just say this. If you're here this morning... What is the message for you if you don't have this Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Acts 4.12 says there's no other name. Maybe you're trusting in another name. Maybe you're trusting in Allah or Buddha or Oprah or even yourself or you don't even know what you're trusting in. The Bible says there's no other name. There's no other person, there's no other king, there's no other savior for which you can trust in than Jesus Christ. And so the call that Peter would say if you were here today, John would say if you're here today, I'm telling you today, repent and put your faith in this Jesus because there's no other name. There's no other way. He who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you do not have Jesus, you do not have life. So trust in this Christ today to be your Lord and Savior. Repent of those sins today. Fall on your face today in humble submission and say, Lord Jesus, I know that you are the only one that can save me from my sins. I've been trusting in myself. I've been trusting in all these other things. I've been dabbling in this and that, and I'm confused on the issue, but I want to settle it this morning and know that there's only one name under heaven. His name is Jesus. The tomb is empty. He's died on the cross. He's risen again. I'm trusting in this Jesus. And the Bible says if you call upon him today, you will be saved. So do it. Call upon the name of Jesus. Let me ask you to bow your heads this morning. Father, we want to be humble in our approach. We don't, Lord, forgive me if I've come across as rude or I've come across as intolerant. I don't want that to be ever. Father, you know the passion in my heart about this issue. And the only reason I'm passionate about it, Lord, is because, Jesus, these were your words. And I know that the only way of salvation is Jesus. I don't want to fool people, Lord. I don't want to be an evangelifish, as some people say, with no backbone. 
I want to lovingly tell this congregation that there is hell and there is heaven and Jesus is the only way to get there. Lord, help us to love this truth. Help us to hold fast this confession of truth without wavering. Help us to stand on the bedrock of this truth. Help us never to equivocate or falter or waver or water down this truth. And regardless of what comes our way from the media, from the world, from our friends, from all these different places, Lord, whatever comes our way in the face of opposition or persecution or annoyance, let us keep on preaching it because we can't help but do it. Like Peter and John said, we can't help but do it. Lord, my prayers, if there's anybody here this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, they, 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 they may have come into this place and they weren't quite sure what was going to happen and they came in this place and, and Holy Spirit, you've gripped their hearts and you've tugged at their hearts and you're drawing them to, to the Father and they don't know what's going on. There's a pounding in their chest. There's, there's a shaking in their body. They're under strong conviction. They don't know what's going on. Would you draw them to the Savior even in this moment and give them the power to cry out to Jesus and call upon him for salvation? Father, would you save many in this room today through the power of the gospel? We need you, Jesus. All of us need you. You are the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through you. Jesus, you have the name that is above all names.